today is going to be a really cool marketing clinic. We have this event every month, different topics each time as led by you. And last time we were together, a few of you really liked the idea of having some mini brand audits for different websites. What we're going to do is today we're going to review five of the websites that I had submitted. We're going to look at your websites. We're going to assess the brand positioning. And what do we mean by brand positioning? We mean, are we able to clearly communicate with our ideal client the following? Here is why you should choose to work with us, not the other options available to you. Most B2B companies don't do this. And it's where we can be inspired by B2C because they're pretty good at it. And the reason that B2C are pretty good at it is that typically they don't have a salesperson selling a can of Coke in a store. They have to rely on getting that message across to us and advertising to us. So the message really has to work. And if it doesn't work, that really shows up in sales. However, in B2B, we can get away with selling without a great brand. So we can build personal relationships, connections. We can have introductions. We can grow to a point where we're unlikely to, after, say, 10 years in business, we're unlikely to be able to keep on top of the volume of contacts that we've created over the years and effectively nurture them, keep in touch with them, keep them warm, build trust. And I'm going to give an example before we jump into the audits. There's a couple of clients recently I've started working with where one of them, the sales journey was literally a few minutes. They had a need, they researched, they found me on TikTok, listened to the podcast. They came on one of these webinars and then we worked together. And another one, it's been four years. We did a bit of consulting four years ago. I explained to this CEO, here's what I think you should do. They did something different. They tried other things, absolutely fine. And she came back to me and said, look, I do want to talk again because I've tried all these things and they didn't work. The reason that I was still front of mind is that I've been regularly communicating value, providing helpful stuff. So you could say, oh, what's the point of sending out those emails with those helpful guides or pr providing free webinars when there's no immediate ROI? You know, you didn't get a lead off that one. Well, I do get immediate sales off things like that. But with this particular example, it was four years before this CEO went ahead with a really great marketing solution. But if I'd just done outreach, as many B2B companies do, oh, hi, do you have a need for what we have? Should we get a coffee? Let's have a bit of a chat. Oh, no worries. I'll get in contact with you again in a year. What I'm not doing in between is educating that person on here's probably why things aren't working for you at the moment. If you're feeling that frustration, here's a few reasons why that might be. The five companies we're going to look at today What's great about these companies is that I think all of you will take practical advice away because there'll probably be parallels between the messaging on these sites as what you've seen. So we're going to look at a company called Trustshare. We're going to look at Energize. We're going to look at Austin Smith Lord. We've got Carolyn here. We're going to look at Infonics. And we're going to look at a company called Drimify, which is going to be an interesting one because it's about gamification, which is fun. So all different sectors. Essentially, these audits today, we're going to be answering the question, are these five brands, are they clearly articulating to their ideal client? Here's why you need to choose us, not the other options. That's great brand positioning. We're going to watch a short video with Simon Sinek on why, the power of why. I think it's in a nutshell, such a good description of a brand finding its why, which is kind of like, sounds a bit like a fluffy term, but he explains it so well and how the power of brand positioning. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media. Then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, 
and they didn't achieve powered man flight. And the Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. So let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. We have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. Hopefully that gets across the fact that most B2B companies are talking about what they sell and how they do things, which is not going to differentiate them. It's very difficult for me to find examples of really well positioned B2B companies other than the ones I've worked on or very good marketing agencies have worked on as well. And so when we look at something like a law firm, Simon mentioned there, it's like saying we have experts, we are committed to the utmost quality. It's all things of how we do this. And we're saying we're the leading or we're one of the leading. But what we're not doing is telling someone, hey, you know, based on your frustrations and the things that you're going through, the things that are making your working life difficult, we understand those and here are the ways in which we're set up to be able to help you with that. And here's why we exist. Here's our passion. Here's what we're about. And that's what we're aiming for within brand positioning. So I'm going to share a screen on our first audit, Trust Share. Obviously a really nice looking site, really beautiful design. And what we're going to look at is the messaging, simple pricing tailored to your specific use case. 
If you're listening to this in the future on the podcast, you can go to trustshare.co and you'll be able to see what I'm looking at. Simple borderless banking infrastructure for marketplaces. So I understand that you offer multi-currency accounts for people who run marketplaces. And so what we can immediately see is that we have a niche. You're saying that you work with marketplaces. And so what I would love to see is versus someone like, let's say Revolut, what is it about TrustShare that tells me that based on me being a marketplace, you're going to be more tailored to me than going with a very big recognizable brand? The first thing I would say in terms of auditing this brand is that we do dive straight into what you sell. And then we dive straight into get started. We're very focused around features of the offering as opposed to here is the problem you're facing as a busy owner of a marketplace. And here is how this is going to help solve your problem. We go straight into releases as well, which I see a lot in tech companies. And we feel like we need to promote this new thing. But what we probably want to be doing is wrapping it around a little bit more with this is an additional benefit to you and weave into our existing messaging framework, as opposed to it being like a standalone thing of here's a release on our product. Because the target audience, they won't see, they don't think of it as I'm buying a tech product. They think of it as I have a need, I have a problem. I run a marketplace and I'm dealing with 15 different currencies and I'm really worried about breaking the law or doing something wrong or losing out on money because I haven't selected the right way to do this. And so I think while this website is looking really smart and I'm loving the colors and the brand, it looks lovely. And I like the name as well. Trust share. It just makes sense, doesn't it? You can just kind of make that connection. What I would recommend in terms of evolving the branding is How can we identify first, because I just made up those pain points, how can we first identify what the pain points are? Well, how can we do that is by asking people, what frustrations do you face in your day-to-day life in the context of what we offer? What keeps you awake at night in the context of work? What frustrations have you had with things you've tried in the past? What have you tried in the past? What worked? What didn't work? talking to existing clients about what did you love about working with us? Why were we better than the other options you tried? These uncover the unique differentiators that should be weaved into the brand messaging. Not only do we need to highlight the pain points and talk about how we'll solve those pain points, we also need to justify how we'll do that better than the other options available too. Because if you are saying the same thing as others, it'll come down to price or who's going to get in front of your customers more. For example, if we Google multi-currency bank for marketplaces, a company like these guys might come up called Juni. And I've landed on their one of their blogs because I think it's a good example where content can really make a difference. So I Googled a phrase and I found a useful article that helped me understand how multi-currency accounts could work, which naturally over time will start to build my trust. There were also lots of comparison review sites that ranked. So it wasn't like Juni and TrustShare and Revolut were necessarily all ranking for the search terms. They were actually review sites saying top 10 multi-currency accounts. And that's likely what your buyers will be reading and researching. So you probably wanna make sure that your SEO is a focus and probably pay-per-click advertising to make sure that you're in with a shot of getting in front of these people. Yes, you need great brand positioning, but if you're the best kept secret and no one ever finds you, you might as well have not investing in that at all. Another thing I observed that while you've got loads of fantastic information on here and the graphics are really lovely, we do go into a little bit too much depth of the actual product itself. This potentially will tell people what we've seen here visually that this is really difficult and whether or not this makes sense to them, I don't know. I think that what we can all do is look at testimonials and reviews from our customers to tell us what they care about. This company is saying simple to use, security, reassurance. These are the things that they care about. I think you've done a great job with the brand and I genuinely love all the colors. They're really nice and I love how this brand looks. I think you could do with bringing it to life with a central brand narrative, which would basically be articulating, okay, here is why we're the better option. Here's your frustrations. And here's how we solve your problem better than our competitors. So you have to be able to do an audit of your competition and what they're saying 
figure out the competition strengths and be able to kind of show them up in a way. What is it that your clients typically find frustrating about working with your competitors that you can maximize your messaging around, that you can build your messaging around? For example, I know that there are lots of marketing consultants out there who consult and advise and give huge reports. And then the CEO or director is like, what do I do with this? So I talk about that in my marketing. I talk about the fact that no lengthy reports that you don't know what to do with, no lofty advice that you'd never be able to resource, just practical tools and ideas that you can put into practice immediately. So I'm not saying anything bad about competitors. And it's highlighting what they find frustrating about people who do what I do. And that's a really good thing to think about in relation to all of your brands. What is it that our competitors do that isn't so great that we can more than make up for? And how can we get that across in our messaging? I also think that content marketing needs to be much more of a focus here. We're not giving anything away. We need to be giving stuff. There was a company called Airwallex. I don't know if you've heard of those guys, but they had a really useful guide that you could download and they had some very good content marketing that's going to build trust. And I imagine they'll have a marketing campaign to go with that. Okay, so now we're going to look at Dreamify with Damien. This is a gamification platform, which is really cool to look at. This is Dreamify.com, D-R-I-M-I-F-Y.com. Create games and interactive experiences, engage your audience. And then we have a brand video talking about it we immediately have some really big brands that's really amazing to see because it gives us that confidence of like wow if these brands are trusting this company then it's obviously really good the first thing that strikes me is that we are again talking about what we sell we do go into benefit to the end client by saying engage your audience I think that what we could do, if you wanted to elevate it, we really want to hone right in on what is it about the end brand manager, for example, who would be buying this. I don't know if that's your ideal audience, Damien, but that would be a really good one to look at. It's like, what is it that bothers them about loyalty schemes and loyalty programs? And what do they need to do ultimately with their audiences? We are, with this example, straight into what we do, the solutions and we probably want to be talking about why we would be the better option over the other options available. So we've got Piggy here, set your brand apart with a gamified program. What they're doing here is they're making a case for your category. They're not making a case for them. And that's what really good brand positioning does. If we only said, I'm a leadership coach and leadership coaches are brilliant and you can get your employees more engaged through leadership coaching, that's building a case for your category. It's not building a case for you. I think for Dreamify, we've got a good what and how, but we don't necessarily feel the story behind this business. Why was it created? What audience is it best suited to? What type of business is it going to best serve? And why would they be the better option for this person over the others? It's great how you've categorized the different sectors. I wonder if there are areas that are more your forerunners and niches that you could go in on. You've got case studies, which is always good to see. And I think that what we could do is elevate the content through having maybe something that people can download so you can get their data now. And a lot of people will argue against gated content, whatever. We can have free content guides or we can ask for someone's email address. I always think it's good if it's a high value enough piece of content to give something away in exchange for data, just to build upon your already, you've got a pretty good case study library here and some blogs. Great that you've got your pricing as well, really clear. I also looked at a company called Talon One. Want to motivate customers while fighting churn? Gamification is the key to customer motivation, raising conversion rates by as much as 700%. So again, they are really making a case for this category and they're using customer pain points to get going. And I think what's great about this brand is that they're really staying in the language of what their ideal client cares about. They're not getting too tempted to move into the service too quickly. You know, accuracy, efficiency, brand loyalty, they've got their great brands there. But again, I don't think any of the companies I'm looking at here are clearly communicating why they would be a better option. That said, if you're in a sector that is not very good at this, so we're gonna look at an architecture practice in a minute, 
architecture companies, construction businesses, manufacturing business, they're not typically known to be savvy in their marketing. And so even just by you elevating into the wording that your customers would care about, you are much more likely to get a better market share. So we're going to look at Austin Smith Lord now. Austin Smith Lord are an architecture practice, and I know the guys there, so it's really nice to see you here. The first thing I would say is we, I know that you guys do great work, so it's lovely to know you. We don't want our first message for the brand to be like this kind of carousel, current things going on. I would suggest that your latest thing that you're needing to promote is kind of further down. So you really want that the top of the website is getting across a clarity of message. What is it about Austin Smith Lord that makes you a better option over other perhaps local architect practices? Why would I choose you instead of somebody else? That's the biggest thing we want to get across. And that will come from audience insight by speaking to your favorite clients, the ones who value you the most. They'll be able to tell you, you can say, why did you choose to work with us instead of someone else who put the quote forward or who you met? And they might say, we just really felt like you were able to balance the fact that this building needed to be incredibly beautiful, but also very functional. And your team's expertise seemed to really give me the confidence that you wouldn't just go off and be too creative and forget about X, Y, or Z. Or it's really important to us with our architect that they work really well within the wider project team. And we felt that you did that. And based on your network and the fact that we've worked on other projects in the past, we knew that you would. And also your work is very beautiful. So we, we chose you. And so that's something that we want to get across is why would they choose you over someone else? When I scroll down, it is feeling like very much a news site without any form of like, here's who we are and what we're about. I know that we've got this here. It is quite faint. So we would probably want to redesign the website in this case, I would say, so that we've got a, a highlight message at the top that's really rooted in effective brand positioning, a bit of intro body. And then we want to go into perhaps like your top solutions or services and they're clickable, maybe different journeys for different users, but it would need to be a strategic process along with a brand positioning piece so that it's not done in isolation. So I think given that it's, a lot of it is managed in-house, you're doing a great job because I know, Carolyn, that you haven't got a huge 100 people marketing team. So I've completely been there. And so what happens is that we're not quite sure where to look when we go into About Us. I know that About Us pages are literally called About Us. I've always felt that About Us should be more about, here's what you need to know about us in the context of what you need. So actually About Us should be more about the ideal client and what they care about. I have worked with a company in your sector, Carolyn, called TC Consult, and their message is something like, we all know that building is an imperfect art. So when things go wrong, inevitably, you need a team that can pull together, really collaborate and get the job done on time and on budget. And that was directly born from speaking to their clients and saying, what do you care about? I don't care about anything apart from my building being built on time, on budget. And those guys know how to get that done. They collaborate, they pull everyone together. And then the mission is defined by the constant purpose. Like, why are we here? What is everyone in this business collectively doing together in order to make something happen? What will never change that constant purpose? I would suggest looking at the mission of to enhance life and environments by design, because I wonder how lofty that is versus what you're actually doing. What you guys do as a type of company is you, you create things for the end client. And so what does the end client care about? So I'm not saying it isn't correct because that may well be the founder's mission. That is what they care about more. But maybe we could make the mission more about, like, for example, that construction business I said, their mission is to make the property and construction process simpler and it was literally like, that is why they exist. So anytime the team makes a mistake, they can say, is that going to make the property and construction process simpler for our client? And they're like, oh no, it's not. Yeah, it's not on our mission then, is it? Like, that's our mission. That's why we're here. So we want a mission that everyone in the company can get behind. I think that it's very similar to the rest of the architects out there. I've seen countless websites and I even looked at many different websites trying to actually find one that did have really great brand positioning and genuinely even the large ones I really struggled if Austin Smith Lord were able to do a bit of brand positioning work to really 
clearly communicate here's why we're better for you than the others based on your frustrations and what you've tried in the past and why our clients love us you would be able to set yourselves apart really easily because your competitors and I've looked a lot simply aren't either and this is not the best thing I've ever seen this was just an example of one company I saw it's like you need an experienced architect in your corner like I'm not I don't even think this is particularly good but it's just the the only example of an architecture practice I could find where they were at least talking about the person who buys from them because really architects are they're creatives aren't they they're it's an art form and so when they're when the architect is in charge of creating their brand they tend to make it about the creative which they care about but actually their ideal client isn't a creative they are a business person a lot of the time and so we need to get out of that architect brain and into the brain of the ideal client I hope that was useful okay in phonics hey Bernard so from my understanding you guys are data strategy consultants so you help companies to use data to make business decisions what I get from here is that we're talking about the how we're really into the how we've got a lot of processes, these types of diagrams and things like that. We're talking straight away about this is our process. This is how it works rather than transform your business through making decisions based on data and really bring into life the benefits of what someone could achieve within their company if they follow this. So rather than showing immediately how we want to be demonstrating the pain points of the customer. I think that this has the opportunity to confuse a little bit whilst it all makes sense and it's very professional and it it's really good to see these processes. I think that when we click on approach, we immediately want to get from that, you know, why would you be different to other people that I'm talking to? It might just bamboozle people a little bit perhaps. There's not to say that this type of content wouldn't be perfect later down the sales line. Once someone's bought into you and what you do and they're like, yeah, I'd like a quote. I'd like to meet with you. Maybe there's some kind of helpful guide that breaks down the approach and how it all works so that you can really justify what you're doing. We do go straight into just request a demo. We have got a blog, which is great to see, and you've got something to sign up for it providing content that's going to be valuable to your audience is going to be really important. We want to see something that people can download or take away, or maybe there's a podcast, or maybe there's something that's going to further build knowledge for them. And again, your testimonials, I saw testimonials, they tell us what people care about. People mentioning the importance of dashboards to them. The word patience has been used. They were really patient with us. That's probably going to be important to your ideal client. They were available to us. All these words within your testimonials are going to give you clues as to genuinely what people care about. I had a look at others. There was a company called Amplify. They were found by pay-per-click advertising. I typed in analytics data strategy partner. Now you could argue that's not exactly it, but this company comes up in sponsored. So it shows us that people are bidding on those keywords. If you wanted to get traffic, establish a data strategy that meets business objectives. Every organization should have a robust data strategy that links directly to their overall business goals. And that data strategy shouldn't be just a stack of paper. It needs to be a roadmap with clearly defined tactical deliverables. Sounds like something you need. Get in touch. Download the guide. There's some big brands there, become a data-driven business, use your data to its full potential. They have got a lot going on for them. There's something there that is going to encourage me to give my data, even if I'm not ready to buy. And that is such a great asset to have in marketing today is how can we collect data by giving something valuable to people so that we can then start to make our case with a nurturing program. If you're like request a demo or contact me now, the first thing that hinges on is you have to make sure that you are able to clearly articulate why you'd be the better choice so that they are compelled to get in touch. And secondly, you'd need to make sure you're actually there. So when I search for that type of thing, you'd have to be on sponsored and, and performing better than your competitors in SEO. What does a good data strategy look like? I thought this was quite good. Delivers quick wins, aligns with the business strategy. Who needs a data strategy? So they've got quite a lot going on here. The other one I looked at was Analytics 8. So data strategy consulting, this company was quite interesting to me, transform your organization with data, like that's a benefit of what we provide. 
It's not necessarily saying why we'd be better, what the frustration is. Your business is unique. Your problem isn't putting it into someone's mind that this is solvable. What you're going through is solvable. And they've got subscribed to our newsletter. And then they've got a pretty good blog and resources section as well. I think they've got podcasts and things like that, recorded webinars, insight blogs, events. They look like they're going to be doing quite good nurturing behind the scenes. If they're getting in front of your clients from pay-per-click advertising and ranking naturally on SEO and they're capturing data and they're providing valuable stuff, they're more likely to be getting sales from people who've got that longer buyer journey, which we know that people have in B2B. Hope that was useful. And then Energize, our last one. Energize is Laura. This is quite interesting to look at. So a sustainability consultancy company. I'm going to have a few minutes on this and then we're going to have a little chat between us. I did not realize how intense it is to use your brain to look at brand positioning because usually I do like a one-to-one call with people for an hour and we have a good chat. But doing five in 30 minutes was perhaps a little bit ambitious. But Damien, you'll remember this on our last webinar, we decided that we would do it. And so here we go. Here we are. Energize. Okay. The headline is leading with what you do. And so we want to get into the place of what do they care about? I had a little look at your industry and everyone seems to think that the ideal client cares about looking after the world. But actually what I imagine your target customer cares about is making sure they meet their commitment as a business in the requirements they have legally upon them. Yes, as an individual with values, they're going to care about the world. Like for the future of our kids, we all do. But the true pain point, just off the top of my head, is probably more about their company meeting legal requirements, making sure they're doing the right thing and that they're not going to be shown up by, I don't know, a shareholder one day or some new policy coming in they didn't know about and they hadn't done what they needed to do. I think if we were all honest, if you were a CEO of a company, you need to make sure you're on top of these things. And so being a force for good, yes, purpose-driven brands are going to like this idea, but I wonder if there's a closer fit pain point that we can talk about. And so by talking to your ideal clients in the brand positioning process, you could figure out what keeps you awake at night in the context of this? What commitments do you have in relation to sustainability that worry you? What have you tried in the past? What have you been frustrated with? What's been complicated? So we have a little look. How can we help you? You've got your services. So we do kind of go straight into that. I think it's a really nice looking site. I think you've done a, a good job. The imagery looks really good. And again, I love the colors today for everyone's brands, orange and blue. We're not talking about why we would be the better option over the other options available and particularly the big boys. So we look at things like McKinsey or KPMG or Deloitte, I imagine, are people who would bigger brands who would do this. I want to know why would I be better off with you than those companies? So obviously they've got tons of arms in their company and they do so many different things. Why would I be better off with you? And also I would say that just looking at your wider website, your forms typically like contact us or get in touch. You probably want to do something that is more around what Anthesis Group is doing. I've searched sustainability consulting firm to have a little look at what people are doing. And I found a company called Sphera, who I think it goes to show that in this sector, there's some very similar looking brands and what they're saying and what they're doing. And so brand positioning would really help you to elevate above the competitors and say something different. I just wanted to show you that one for that reason. And then Anthesis Group are a company to look at because they're similar in that they don't seem to talk about the pain point of the customer they do talk about the transition to net zero i guess is going to be of interest to very lofty large businesses in a nutshell what i would say for energize is that we need to make a case for first of all why you'd be the better option over the bigger players who may have more trust because of their name and second of all why are you different and better than the other players of your own size who are saying the same thing and so It can be a case of why be a small fish in a big pond? We care about you more, that type of thing. And maybe there's a sweet spot client size that someone like McKinsey is servicing that you provide a better service to. And that can become your ideal client because it's easy to steal them away from the big players, but they're not too small that they're not worth your time. And then you can communicate why you're better than the others in certain things. Like maybe you've got more experienced experts. Maybe you have 
some element that they don't have, or maybe you're set up better to meet customer needs. So, wow, that was like super intense. I don't know why I decided to do five. I think one might have been a good idea. I saw someone doing a TikTok mini audit the other day, and it was like they just whipped through giving some tips. That was intense. This B2B marketing clinic is live every month, and the Q&A can be just ask me anything at all in relation to your marketing challenges. So please don't feel that it has to be specific to thing. I've got a question, Jared. Oh, hi, Bernard. So I'm wondering, our company has the vision to simplify and demystify analytic solutions for all, essentially. That's what it is. How would I be able to transform that into a why that can emotionally connect with people? Yeah, I think it's going to be about figuring out what it is that they care about and what problems they're facing and then connecting that with it where the passion from your founder originally came from so like for example most founders set something up because they saw that something wasn't working and they wanted to be the answer to that and then somewhere along the line things get a little bit muddied and we over talk about process and we don't really know how to communicate this what is it that you're wanting to change about how businesses deal with data the best companies in the world who will help people with data strategy are going to be the ones who truly passionately want to fix the complexity of it sometimes what also happens is that we get so driven by the end customer that we're having all these offshoot offerings and maybe sometimes a company shouldn't have done that they should have stuck to that reason of why they exist we exist because we noticed that this was traditionally overcomplicated, and we wanted to put an end to that by setting up our unique process which includes xyz i'm not saying that it has to be like this exciting amazing thing but it does need to be something that's motivating as to why would that make you best placed to help people to transform their business through the data that's available to them so that I can believe you when you say that you'll be able to make that transformation? So it's kind of like with my business, I come from a background where I've worked in corporate and now I'm a consultant, so I've got 18 years experience, but there's loads of marketing consultants who've got experience beyond mine. You could have a marketing consultant with 25 years experience. So if I just said, I'm a marketing consultant based in Cardiff with 25 years experience as my only message, it's not going to get across why I'd be better for someone than the other options. But because I've come up with the concept of the B2B marketing gap and the fact I closed that gap, I talk about, okay, I was a junior marketer reporting into CEOs and there was this huge void between the business directors and this marketing resource. And I exist because I passionately want to support marketers to be assertive, to build a business case for investment in marketing. And I want to coach CEOs to go easier on their marketers and to provide them with the insights and resources they need. My TikTok, for example, has exploded because people are like, I engage with this emotionally. This is how I'm feeling. I'm not feeling valued. I'm not given the budget. You're empowering me now. And so that's the brand story that is my why I exist. I provide marketing consulting. I do power hours. Why do I exist? The how is the services, the power hour calls, the strategy calls. The why is my story i'm passionately committed to having the back of marketers even when i'm talking to ceos i'm fundamentally on the side of marketers they're not underperforming they're doing the best of what they've got and it's a reason for people to believe so there is a bit of a process there bernard and it's hard for me to off the top of my head know exactly why but i think that's a bit of an example fleshed out there definitely that was amazing questions. thank you oh i'm glad it was at least a little bit useful Zara says, for your strategy calls, how do you approach those? Would it be a similar format today where we review website and current marketing? Hey, Zara, it's nice to meet you. So no, it wouldn't be. This was a very specific topic today. This isn't what we do each time. We obviously can do that. The way that the strategy calls work is that people book in for those and then they complete a form to say, like, what is the biggest challenge with the marketing? What have you tried in the past? What are the goals for the business? What's the growth needed? what is your marketing budget at the moment? And then we have a discussion to figure out what is going to be the best next steps.
for getting sales into the company or for the marketing challenge. Sometimes my recommendations to companies and only last week, a company in Canada, I was consulting. It was like, do you know what? You do need some brand printing and a new website. But actually for the minute, this company, they needed sales on the board. They were a startup, a five-year-old startup, but they were a startup. And it was like, do you know what? We need to get a campaign going. We need to get some data in. We need to do some pay-per-click advertising. We need to do some social content advertising. We've got to get some numbers on the board. And then once that's starting to grow, let's focus on the brand positioning because you're getting pressure from your founders. And so that was a very tailored approach where there's other businesses where sales are really steady. They're organically growing really well. They're not managing to differentiate from the competitors. Their website has got some issues. They haven't got a database. They're not communicating regularly with their audience. They're not using social very well and they haven't got the resources. So it really is kind of tailored to each business there. Laura says, customers struggling to secure approvals to publish case studies. Is anybody else struggling with this? So the first thing I would say about case studies is you really need to hire a copywriter to do that. And the best process is to find a really great copywriter who has experience in your sector. You need to get them to interview the person who is responsible for the project that you are doing a case study on. So they have a talk to them and they ask them questions. So they should be led by you and maybe your sales director or your operations director. On These are the case studies. We've got 10 of them. And these were the problems and then how we handled it and the outcome. So really problem solution, outcome focused. And then so making sure your copyright has a really good process for that. They interview, they write it, then they send it to marketing for approval. The only thing that should be approved by the salesperson themselves is essentially the notes that were taken down. So once they've interviewed them and taken down the key points, they can send that to the person and say, are you comfortable that I've captured the right information? And then everything else in my view is marketing's decision. It's about marketing being comfortable. Perhaps your leaders will also sign it off, but there comes a point where you need to make sure they trust you that it's the right thing. And actually getting something out there is better than nothing, but really having that process right and finding out why is it that they're not wanting to approve it. You know, are the, the worst thing you can do is have in-house the in-house subject matter experts writing this stuff. You often see that blogs on websites are written by the experts in the company, not a blog writing specialist who understands from marketing, here is the pain point of the audience, and here is the information that feeds into that, and here's the unique angle of this company. So your expert in-house is not a marketing and comms expert. They are an expert in what they do. They do not know how to write something that's going to make someone want to buy from your company. So that's really common. But Laura, I'd be interested to know a bit more about why there are roadblocks for you. Is it that they don't like the content produced? Is it that they are too slow? Mia says, I find most customers are happy to comply with us as we make sure it's entirely mutually beneficial to promoting their brand and talking about them. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of the time, these companies, they're just nervous. They're not sure that they should be allowed to. So you could also ask to speak to their comms department because it's very normal for companies to write case studies. You can also talk about the fact it's good for their search engine optimization for them to be mentioned and it's good promotion for them. So yeah. And then Laura says that makes sense. Maybe we don't make it obvious enough that it benefits them too. And they see it as a cheeky favor. Yeah. So like it could be about how it's being positioned. It probably doesn't help that our direct contacts don't understand or think about marketing. Yeah. So it could be about changing the process. And maybe if you engage a copywriting case study partner, you could ask them what process they recommend would be best and go from there. Hi, Karen. Do you think with product managers to help them develop the why does a client need the product rather than what the product is would be good to expand the audience? Okay. I was just thinking about it from the point of view of future sessions because in my role as a project manager, I found I get handed a project and I'm having to justify it to the client because that product level thinking about the why just hasn't been covered with them or has been particularly weak. Yeah, I think that's going to be about looking at how the company can become more in sync. So departments are truly working together and becoming customer centric, making sure that our offering is genuinely built around what our client expects to receive from us and wants from us. And then making sure that we are built around that, not trying to have 
the client makes sense of what we're doing in our workings. And I know that's not like a fun answer because it means there's like a lot of pushing above. But it's like what Simon said in the earlier video. It's like, this is why some companies prosper and some don't. Like the ones who have owners who are like, I am building my company around exactly what my customers want and I'm going to figure out what they want and I'm going to do it better than everyone else and I'm going to set my business up right and I'm going to get all my teams working together. That's why they'll prosper over the others. Sometimes people get blindsided like, well, why did we lose that client? And it'll be one of those type of companies where they just were set up better in what they're doing. Thanks, Jade. I was aware I might be creating a tangent so apologies but yeah that was good. no no I'm just reading your question again work with product managers to help them develop the why does a client need the product rather than what the product is do you mean communicating to a client here is why you need a product yeah as an example I was working on a data analytics project where we were moving off Cognos onto Microsoft SSIS yeah and the sponsor, he just stopped talking to the product manager because the product manager just kept talking tech, which yeah. is what you pointed out on one of the case studies you were looking at. Yeah. And he just didn't understand what he was getting and he didn't understand why we were doing it, therefore. And so he just canned the project, which yeah. was technologically the wrong thing to do. But he's not interested in the tech. He's in, interested in why it's being done. I think this is where the role of account directors who are overall responsible for an account and they can protect that client from, it's like, I will bring in the tech person to sit next to me to say stuff that's in answer to a technical question as and when needed, but I'm never going to allow a tech person who is unable to talk in a mindset type way. We're going to build our structure as an organization to make sure that the client is only ever speaking to the right person at the right time. And an account director is responsible for making sure that happens. You can use things like NPS to use real data. So like when I worked in a large corporate, we had this huge account for NPS score and a net promoter score. And so what we'd recognize is that we, we serviced massive companies and so you could survey the CEO about how they felt about us. And she would say eight out of 10. But if the person on the ground at store level who was actually dealing with us was at a three out of 10, six months later, that would trickle upward to the CEO and we'd be wiped. But by the time the CEO was three out of 10, that would be way too late. And so we needed to know data from everyone who was influencing working with us. And that would tell us, okay, we have a problem, account director, get on it, what's going on? Ah, the technical person is chewing their ear off and they're really confused, right? Stop that happening. And it's kind of giving that insight and feeding it back to a larger team, operations team, product team, marketing, customer service, so that everyone is very clear about here's who speaks to clients and when. And there was another similar one where I did some insight work for a company and they were finding that the NPS score was going down and people weren't feeling great about the company. And it was all based on who was answering the phone. There was a very like not friendly person answering the phone just by nature. You know, some people like, hello, how can I help you today? The person who answered every phone call in the office was a hello. Who is it you need? Right. I don't know if they're here. No, they're not here. Right. Yeah. Try again later. Bye. Just really like that. And it just started to dent confidence over time. And it's like, they would never have known that unless they had these research things where it's like, well, the person who answers the phone's a bit grumpy and that came up 11 times. You're like, oh, people are really having a poor reception from the business. So they set up a service where no matter what happens, it's always an incredible person answering the phone, taking a message, that type of thing. So I hope that makes a bit of sense. Brilliant. Okay, guys, it's been great to see you all. In the meantime, if you found this interesting, you can listen to my podcast, the B2B Marketing Gap podcast. Just go to the link in my profile on any of my social media channels. And yeah, I'm going to see you again very soon. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Bye, everyone.